Give back my medicine money, medicine money. Welcome, everybody. It's groundbreaking to be here today in solidarity with you. I'd like to thank Hui Hui for organizing and promoting this event. As usual, she's done a great job. And it's also groundbreaking for me because she invited me. I didn't have to great crash. <laughs> this is a really professionally organized event. Honglin Park used to be somewhere we came because we had no place else to go, a last resort. Over the last month or so, Honglin Park has really grown up. It's become the best place, the only place to have an honest conversation. Our little bit of the park has become a marketplace, a marketplace of ideas, one where Singaporeans are beginning to stand up for their rights and demand freedom of expression. When a young man emerged, a blogger, and he was sued by the head of GIC, a very rich and powerful man, who also happens to be Prime Minister. There was a seismic shift in Singapore, like Force 8 on the Richter scale. And when that young man raised over $100,000 in a few weeks, it was to pay his legal costs, it was like a tsunami. <laughs> and the changes going through in Singapore society are like a wall of water bearing down on us, sweeping away oppression in its wake. Peace and victory. Singaporeans, we are a peace-loving people. Yes. We are a well-behaved people on the whole. We don't like to make a fuss. That's right. But today, I'm going to ask you to make a bit of a fuss. In fact, I'm going to ask you to make a lot of noise yeah. on Roy's behalf. This is the time. This is the three for us. So all together, let's hear it. Let's put our hands together and cheer Roy. Thank you, everybody. Now, today's rally is about MediShield's life. I'm not going to say very much about MediShield life, because I think there are many other speakers who are better qualified to talk about it than me. But I'd just like to say a few things. Like everything else the government manages, MediShield's life 
has managed to run up a huge surplus in a very short space of time. The government says this is necessary to meet future liabilities. I don't agree. We don't agree too. I don't agree. The, the government is not accounting for the investment income that it earns on the premium. And did you know that in the US there's a rule that private insurers have to hand back uh, when the claims in any year are less than 85% of the premiums collected, they have to give their customers a rebate. Why don't we have that rule here? And why stop? So we should have that rule here. But why stop there? MediShield, after all, is fairly small for the surplus. As the government would say, it's peanuts. So, why don't we apply the same rule to the government's surplus? Not the funny figure that Tarman presents every year to Parliament, which is a charade, why don't we apply it to the general government surplus, the one that the IMF uses, that includes investment income, interest income, land sales, and receipts, capital receipts. If that exceeds a certain percentage of GDP, the government should give all of us a rebate and pay it in cash. Not in, not in funny money in our CPF account, which we can't touch till we die. The PAP always say that the opposition will squander the reserves. Well, wake up, PAP. We are wise to you and your tricks. It's, we are wise that if anybody is likely to squander the reserves, you seem to be doing a pretty good job of it. Earlier, you heard your, my friend, uh, Mr. Tankin Lian, talk about MediShield and about the confusion that even an insurance specialist encounters when dealing with it. I am going to, and throughout this afternoon, you are going to hear a lot about the questions we still have. Questions that Hari Kumar tried to dodge questions that the PAP don't want to answer, but we need answers to. But before we think about answers, let me tell you a story about questions. A young boy sees a man sitting on a park bench with a big, beautiful looking dog. And the young boy loves dogs. So he goes up to the man and he says, Sir, is your dog, does your dog bite? And the man says, No. So the boy reaches out his hand to pet the dog. And quick as a flash, the dog sinks his teeth into the man's arm, into the boy's arm. And the boy runs around screaming and crying for a while. And when he calms down, he sobs. In between sobs, he says to the man, but you said your dog didn't bite. And the man says, that's correct. 
that's not, that's not my dog. My dog doesn't bite. So you see, it's not a quest, it's not about us asking questions. It's about asking the right questions and about seeing that we ask the right person the right question. So what is the right question? I believe the right question is a truth that makes us uncomfortable. Not just the PAP, but all of us try to avoid asking questions that may produce a truth that is uncomfortable. One should, but one should never be afraid of the truth. The promise between a government and its people is like a coin. Truth is on one side of the coin, trust on the other side. Truth leads to trust and trust leads to truth. When the PAP refuse to open up the books and tell us how they are managing the reserves, they break that trust. Now, the PAP will no doubt start to ask you a great many questions to make you feel uncomfortable and to shake your belief. But we must never try to forget the facts because they make us feel uncomfortable. Last week, a PAP man, Mohammed Bashir, spoke here at Honglin Park. He asked, but he didn't get very far, but before he left, he asked the question, is the opposition ready to take over? Yes. Is that the right question? Yes. No. No. Of course not. No opposition is ever ready to take over. Why? The opposition will never be ready to take over. You are right. Often change happens more quickly than everyone expects. So even in a democracy, the opposition isn't ready to take over. But when we do have a change, you'll find that that is how democracy works. And that is how we improve the lives of the people. That's how we get accountability. We get a change of government. Today, it's my duty to tell you the truth and give you the facts, even if they make you uncomfortable. It's my duty to tell you the right question and the right person to ask even if it makes me unpopular. You see, my popularity doesn't matter. What matters is the dignity of our people, the success of our nation, and the future of our way of life. I don't think there's any point in asking the PAP questions anymore. They are not going to answer. Hari Kumar somehow thinks that it's appropriate to compare organizing a forum badly with the America's greatest general rallying the troops on the eve of a crucial battle 
against the Nazis. The only struggle I saw in his forum was when one of his troops, a big burly man, laid his hands on a little old lady in an effort to get her to stop speaking and move away from the mic. And Hari Kumar later spoke to the press and gave them the old lady's address, making her the subject of online harassment. Was there any way for an MP to treat one of his constituents? No. Was that a, a, the way a senior counsel should behave, no. who knows about client confidentiality? Uli. No. Hari Kuma is mistaken. He's not engaged in a noble fight for freedom and democracy. He and the PAP are just magicians pulling off conjuring tricks in a cheap magic show. There's only one question and only one person to be asked. You see, the question is not whether the opposition is ready to take over or not. It's, are you prepared for, are you prepared to live with this dynasty for another 50 years? Are you prepared not to have a change of government? No! no. We want change! Are you prepared when you look into your children's eyes to say when I had the chance to make a difference, I made the right choice. So when you go home tonight, I want you to do a thought experiment. I want you to look into the mirror and say, am I prepared to vote the PAP out? Am I prepared, am I prepared to do what is right? for the sake of my children, my children's children, and my, my grandchildren. Thank you everybody for listening to me. Have a great weekend.